let's say, you know, you're all the same church. And I said, I want you all to write a paper, you know, on why, you know, our worship service is better than the, the church down the street there. But you're not allowed to tell me anything that the other place does. Yeah, yeah, they're they're gonna make they're gonna make their own assumptions about that. Now I want I want to show you something. Her her comment was that that a, a culture is gonna make certain assumptions about what common knowledge is. Like if you're writing a flood story, there's gonna be elements in there that everybody should just know. I mean, there's gonna be some unique elements in there too, and that would take us back to okay, if you're using the the raven thing. You know, that's probably not like in everybody's story. Water's probably in everybody's story. <laughs> you know, but the raven thing is a little too narrow. And so you had to be looking at that. You had to have some reason that that was useful to you. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to the usefulness and reasonable. I want to show you something. I did not have you read this. And I'm going I'm to show you two things, I think, tonight. And um, I've given both of these to John, and we'll put these online. But this is from a, it's from a book here, from Babylon to Baghdad, ancient Iraq and the modern West. And the, the first or the second, well, first article, but the second item here, The Genesis of Genesis by Victor Hurwitz. Hurwitz is a cuneiform guy and a biblical studies guy. This is from, uh, it's either Biblical Archaeology Review put this out or the Biblical Archaeological Society. So he is the creation story of Babylonian. So he's going through all this stuff. And, you know, there's our, our buddy George Smith. You know, we can lay all, all the blame at his feet, you know, for a lot of this stuff. And then Dalich is going to come into the picture. But he goes through the, the different story elements. And then he gets to Lambert. There's Lambert's article. All told, Lambert sees the connections between Genesis 1 and Enuma Elish as relatively few in number. Again, you read the article, so that, that shouldn't be news to you. But he, he also notes something else. Many of the parallels between the Babylonian poem and the Bible are as common throughout Near Eastern literature as to be insignificant. There you go. That's the point. Common knowledge. There, that, that's a legitimate thing even back here. As recent scholarship is making clear, simplistic comparison between Enuma Elish and the biblical tra tradition as if the Bible were directly dependent on Enuma Elish and it alone is patently untenable. In other words, it's nonsense. And yet there's clearly some kind of relationship. Then he talks a little bit about Dalich and Smith and he has this observation. He starts looking at, well, let's compare Mesopotamian stuff to other Mesopotamian. The author of Enuma Elish is deliberately attributing to Marduk and Babylon acts ascribed to other gods and cities in other myths about the same subject. The author is stealing the thunder of these gods, undermining them in favor of Marduk. So what he described is Hurwitz makes the point that, you know, if you compare just the Mesopotamian stuff, here you have an old text and the hero god is, you know, Anlil. But if you go into, into Babylon, the Babylonian period, which is later, 6th century BC, all of a sudden it's Marduk. And, and the Marduk story looks a lot like this older one. So it isn't just those two. It's more than two. As you acquire and translate more flood stories, or not flood stories, but, well, flood or creation, whatever it is here, his article's wider than just the creation stuff this week. You begin to notice that the real agenda here is not, we're so dumb we can't come up with a story. I'm so glad we have a library so I have something to write now. I'm going to steal this guy blind and put my name on it. That is not the agenda. The agenda is to use the material theologically. So what the biblical guy is doing is pretty much the same as what everybody else is doing. But no one is thinking that one is dependent on the other because they don't have something to write. It's all about 
religious and theological messaging. Now, having said that, again, it reflects a political theological competition over primacy. So if we say that, I want to go to the key question here. Well, do I even have it at the end? I'm just going to give it to you because I don't know if I have it at the end exactly. Here's the question. And I hope you get the point right away. If I'm a, a Hebrew, an Israelite, a biblical writer, and I want to write a creation story, and I want to give credit to Yahweh as the creator, both for my audience and also as sort of a smackdown to our theological and religious competitors. How can I possibly do that without borrowing? Think about that. How would you do it? You, there's no way you can do it without dipping into the material. It would be like me assigning you Let's say, you know, you're all the same church. And I said, I want you all to write a paper, you know, on why, you know, our worship service is better than the, the church down the street there. But you're not allowed to tell me anything that the other place does. Like, how am I supposed to do that? I've got to be able to dip in to what they do and say to make the comparison. That's the point. It's not that, again, the biblical writers' heads were so empty and, and the Israelites alone are so stupid that they can't write anything down. The point is, because they have the agenda they do, they must do something with the other material. Sometimes it'll be a thought. Put that in my own words. Sometimes it'll be a specific word or phrase or an item because they want their readers to hook mentally back into the thing that they are comparing to. If they can't use the material, there's no way to do it. It's just not possible. Now, if, if you're thinking that, that reframes entirely the whole relationship between biblical material and the comparative material. And this happens not only with Bible and Babylon, it happens within Babylon, competing city-states. People are used to doing this. This is how you do theology. This is how you do polemic. You must dip into the other material or else you got nothing. You got nothing to say. You got nothing to work with. So it's not one's intellectually up here and the other ones are like the three stooges. Okay, no, no, there, there are no stooges in this picture. There are people who know exactly what they're doing and why. 